In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observe his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, as it has been written by the prophet. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem. Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up and take this child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated and sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. Grace and peace to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, as the decorations are out and Advent is in full swing, Christmas is only a few weeks away, and yet I present you an epiphany story. Here, though, we continue to these stories about the nativity and the scene that is set before us uh, gets us to start rethinking and maybe imagining beyond the usual suspects of the people who appear at the nativity scene. So today's journey is definitely unique. We lift up someone that we typically don't talk about. Last week, we focused on Elizabeth and her response to the news, how the family line with Mary uh, brought this special closeness to her and having this baby of her own, she was with Mary in spirit. And then, of course, today we move to this story of the Magi, the wise men. And yes, it feels out of place. It's too soon. These visitors don't arrive until the 12th day of Christmas, typically. And I know what 28% of you are thinking. No Christmas songs until Christmas. And it's way too soon to be talking about the wise men and the Magi. And you'd be right. I get it. They don't belong here. Not yet. But the presence of Herod in this story is definitely something that I think is worthy of taking note. How did the people feel about Herod? Herod the Great wasn't so great. Herod was also the king of the Jews. And it was a title that was assigned to him not by the Jewish leaders, but by the Roman Empire. So when we think about Herod the Great, he wasn't anointed like Samuel anointing Saul or David. In fact, Herod's, uh, Herod's dad was converted and his, his lineage was of Arab descent. His position was obtained through friendship and loyalty to Mark Antony, uh, not through the Jewish leaders and rising up through the ranks by any means. He wasn't a devout Jew who was obedient to all of the religious practices. Instead, he had Greek influences and he was looking to modernize the people, take them into this enlightened part of the modern world. Herod would be seen, I would say, as someone very favorable to the religious elite at the time. He wasn't getting in their way. He was much like em uh, Emperor Constantine would be 300 years later when Christianity was starting to emerge uh, and be able to come out into the light. Herod did have a reputation, as the kids found out today. He had a reputation for killing those who threatened his power. He doesn't appear to have any uh, mass genocides, but he certainly does take out and kill people, especially in his own family. Yet even the massacre of innocence, which was the very end of that story, that uh, killing all of the babies around uh, uh, Bethlehem, 
It was such an insignificant part of the story that the history books don't even acknowledge it. The only place that we see it is really written in the Bible. His behavior is in line with a ruler who is looking to eliminate the threats to his throne. And so as the Magi come to Herod to see this newborn king of the Jews, they go to his place because naturally, where would the newborn king be? Right there where the current king is. And as Herod takes in this information, I'm sure it was very threatening. That line that I just keep coming back to is, remember, all of Jerusalem was frightened with him. And part of me thinks that this is just like, okay, really? Are they really afraid with him? Why would Jerusalem be afraid? Why would Jerusalem be frightened with King Herod? He's just looking out for his own power. But then I got to thinking about it. Perhaps some things haven't changed. If you're a person living in Jerusalem and someone's coming after his power, innocent people might be killed. What would the rest of Jerusalem be frightened of? Perhaps a revolt, a coup. People get frightened by political instability. And isn't that exactly what the people wanted in the first place? Yeah, they wanted a Messiah. They wanted a Messiah to lead a revolt. But they wanted that against the Roman Empire, the occupying force, not against their actual current king, who in many ways, if you were living in Jerusalem, kind of had some nice added benefits for you. There were some perks for having a king who was doing well with the empire, but also looking out for his people. Maybe here it is great. If I can get you to walk out of here thinking that by the end of the day, well, all right, Herod, I'll make my case for you, okay? Herod was pretty successful. He provided for his people. In fact, it's recorded that during a famine, he was able to set up a social program for people to be able to, to survive and to be able to have uh, food and to have uh, a living. Herod's famous for building the second temple. And let's be honest, this is a pretty huge deal. Who wanted to build the first temple? Well, it's King David. He wanted to build the first temple. Who did build the first temple? his son, Solomon. This was a big part of the history and the lineage, and it was a long time before a second temple could be rebuilt. And it's under Herod's watch that this happened. This temple right here, the second temple, would actually last until the siege of Jerusalem, which happened in the year 70 AD. And if you think about it, the Wailing Wall, which is still there, and it still remains, is one of those remnants that connects us all the way back to that time of King Herod. King Herod, through the history books, through the lens of the history books, provides maybe a different impression than what we get when we we read the Bible. Which is why I think it's an important part of the story with the Magi. Because to a foreigner like the Magi who are coming to town, I would think that the stories of King Herod that they heard were probably affirming, like, this is a good reason to go straight to him. This is probably where the newborn king is. Why wouldn't the newborn king be right here. Which does, of course, set off some alarms for Herod. No king wants to hear that their power is being challenged. And Herod easily plays along with the news with the Magi, charming them into saying, oh, please let me know where you find this king so I can go and also honor this king. But we know that's not what he wants. We hear later on that in a dream they go another way. But it's also likely that they had that intuition after meeting Herod and after they heard a little bit more about Herod. Is it possible that after they've met Herod that other people have kind of come along and they said, hey, how was it meeting the king? And they're like, oh, great. He was a nice, swell guy. We had a great time. Maybe, but they also probably filled them in on what kind of character Herod was. What was his qualities of, as a leader? You know, Herod was susceptible to jealousy. He was convinced that his wife was out to get him, so he had her killed. And then later on, her two sons, her brother, her grandfather, her mother, other political threats were dealt with in a similar fashion. The massacre of innocents. And if you think about it, if these magi are right, one of these young children who's living in in Bethlehem is a threat to his throne. For Herod, what do you do with a threat? You eliminate it. 
even if it was the people that he loved. Rarely do we talk about King Herod other than to acknowledge his desire to kill Jesus. And that's usually enough information, it is for me, to form an opinion about him and to think, okay, we can disregard him. He doesn't really have anything else that we need. It's a corrupt, sinful world that Jesus is born into. Were Herod's motives pure? No, of course not. Yet, Herod's factoring into this story is important. In her book, An Unlikely Advent, the author, Rachel Billups, suggests that we all have a little Herod inside of us. That's really hard to hear. I don't want to think about that. Now, this isn't to suggest that we would all do horrible, atrocious things like King Herod does, but to think about the temptations of sin in this world that do grab a hold of us and influence us. I know what jealousy feels like. We all know what it feels like to be greedy, to covet, to to have that desire for something or someone. We all know what it feels like to judge someone based solely on their looks. When we get pushed around, what do we do? To be honest with you, in my life, I've been poked and provoked a few times. And rarely when that happens do I have a really great response that I'm proud of. Often, when I do get provoked, I match that level of behavior, either through words or my actions, instead of taking the high road. So this is Advent. This is the time of waiting. What are we waiting for? We are waiting for the birth of a savior because we keep falling short of God's expectations. We keep giving in to temptations. We keep messing up. And we know that we can't be righteous. We can't have it all figured out on our own. We need Jesus. These foreign men, these magi who've come from afar, perhaps the greatest gift that they share with us is this gift of self-awareness. Once they realize Herod can't be trusted, they move on. They go home a different way. They tell Mary and Joseph, maybe you can't trust King Herod. You might be in danger too. And then Joseph's dream affirms that. In our self-awareness, think about our own intuitions. Our intuition, it's an important relationship that we have with God. God is communicating to us through dreams, through prayer, through our gut, through the silence, and sometimes even through the chaos. So this Advent message today is to trust that God is with us. Trust that we will overcome the challenges that face us. Trust that Jesus is redeeming us each and every day. And that with each of these characters that's surrounding Jesus at his birth, maybe just maybe we see ourselves present there too. Folks, we indeed are captive to sin, captive to our own fears, captive to our own insecurities, to our doubts, to our uncertainties. But fear doesn't have the last word. You see, there is hope. There is a future promise. Jesus has paid the ransom from our captivity. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O church. Jesus is coming. Amen. 